Okay. Um, we are going to see today uh, more techniques of uh, for writing good papers, and uh, because we uh, were only seeing the, the last classes, uh, some techniques of um, how to be published, which uh, themes to choose, and, and other things. Uh, last class, we started to see uh, some techniques to build good theory from uh, previous available uh, papers. So uh, this class and the, the, the last one that is going to be th the next uh, not on uh, 27th, but uh, in the, the next day, we are going to see more, uh, more text about uh, theory building. Because sometimes we have uh, some problems when collecting data from people uh, in the form of interviews or in, the sur in, in surveys. But um, when we start building theory from previous uh, studies, we, we don't depend on field data. We only depend on ourselves. So uh, when, when we start uh, uh, writing theoretical papers, we, we start uh, relying more on our cap capacity than in the schedule or in the budget or things like that. Well, uh, we are starting uh, with the uh, writing papers techniques, and in the, in the, in the uh, final part of the, the quest, we are going to see uh, some techniques to, to build theory using, uh, uh, using papers. OK. The first thing that uh, we are going to see is uh, from a guy from Hong Kong. Yes, it's from Hong Kong, from the health scholarly area. Um, and uh, he, he tries to give some tips, again, about uh, how to, to publish your paper. So uh, before writing your paper, you have You, you are seeing the, the text, okay? The, uh, it's readable? Okay. So uh, the first thing is um, getting used to the language and the themes that the, that the journal that you, are, uh, that you have in mind uh, to publish. So uh, you read uh, previous papers from previous uh, issues of, of that uh, of that uh, journal, and then uh, when you you get the the form and the things of that uh, journal that they they like they they prefer, uh, you you start to be to get a view of what your paper uh, is going to to have. The second tip is that uh, you can always rely on your uh, more experienced colleagues to give uh, a first uh, reading of your, of your paper. So um, if you uh, try to, to submit your paper uh, before uh, uh, giving your, your colleagues to read, sometimes uh, your paper is uh, um, a little crude, a little... Uh, it, it can be improved a lot before uh, going to a, a submission. So uh, if you uh, go uh, uh, get your paper uh, read by your colleagues, more experienced colleagues, uh, sometimes uh, you avoid uh, two or three steps of uh, of reviewing uh, along the the journal. Okay. So. 
So this paper was really short, only two pages. Then we go to the next. The second paper is a uh, is inside the nursing area, but uh, you are going to see that uh, the, the advices that he gives is almost the same as the people from medicine, from epidemiology, from mathematics, from statistics, and anyone. Because uh, the, the scholarly culture is very uh, homogeneous in, in, in many of the, the issues that uh, uh, approached. Okay. First, the, the author says that uh, when we write papers, the, the better uh, achievement that we, we can have is that uh, we organize our thoughts about a particular topic. You uh, uh, start uh, to to organize better pa papers when you write. When you are only reading papers, uh, I think that you already uh, take notice of that. Uh, when you only read, the, the ideas are, are a little blurred, a little uh, dispersed. And then uh, only when you categorize and uh, start writing that you start organizing that huge amount of, of data into an uh, uh, intelligible uh, set of ideas. So uh, only when you write you achieve that. When you only read, sometimes uh, the ideas are only burdened and dispersed. Okay, and uh, another benefit that you have when you start uh, publishing or submitting papers in, in to a journal is that uh, you get your your work known, but by other people than the circle of people that you have in your own community or university. So uh, you are only known, but the whole community of that scene when you submit papers to journals of that area. Okay. Sometimes, uh, because we, we start getting noticed by the, the community of that area, we can uh, get some proposals of work and anything, so it can be materially uh, rewarding, okay. <sighs> so uh, the author uh, start, uh, starts the, the text, the, the methodol methodology uh, part, with uh, some, I don't know how to say that. He tries to encourage us to start writing, uh, even if we don't write very well uh, in the beginning. So when uh, when he he starts the this part, he the the best advice that he gives is begin uh, the. The text is not going to be very, very nice. The text is not going to be very understandable or organized. But if you don't begin, uh, you don't uh, go through, the, through and uh, advance that uh, phase of uh, the panic of the bank page. The, this initial phase is, is the worst one. So uh, begin, and then this phase is gone. Next, uh, the author uh, gives the advice of always count words because the international papers only uh, say 
uh, how many uh, words the, the your paper has to have. But uh, here in Brazil, the, the, the journals that try to, to, to put a limit to the number of, or to the size of your paper, they don't give the word count. They only give the, the page count. So here in Brazil, the normal is to have papers of 15 pages and of uh, 30 pages. Uh, in the international papers, um, the most normal uh, range is uh, from the word count of uh, 80,000 8, uh, to 12,000. For example, when uh, we were submitting a paper to Voluntas, is, that is a, a journal from the third sector, and uh, the best part is that uh, it does not have a, a submission fee of uh, normally uh, $5,000. Uh, many areas have this uh, submission fee, and this one uh, usually don't, don't have. Uh, so, they ask to the paper to be the most, uh, the, the, the most long of uh, 10,000 words. If it passes uh, 10,000 words, uh, if, uh, usually the, the reviewer don't even uh, get the paper to the, to the professors that are going to uh, evaluate your, your paper in the band review process. It stops at, at the desk review. If uh, it's, it's not well formatted, if it's not uh, the size that it has to be, if it's not uh, in the scope of the themes that that uh, journal covers, it only goes to the, to the desk review and stops there. So uh, before submitting, check always the really, really uh, meticulously the, the submission norms of that journal because if you don't, it, 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 it will stop in the desk review phase. So, uh, the author also says that um, we, in, in our entire car career, we are going to, to pass through many phases. So, uh, in medicine, uh, uh, there are another phases. Uh, here in, in social sciences and human sciences, we have the phase that we, we write reviews of books from other researchers. Then you start writing little papers, short papers. Then you start writing long papers. And then in the last phase that we, we, we always want to achieve is uh, you start uh, having uh, invited papers. So you, uh, people know that uh, you know so much about that thing that uh, that journal wants you to, to publish a, an invited paper about that thing. And uh, in that phase, you use a little less citations than before in the long papers and short, short papers because your opinion is worthy uh, to, to count in that uh, paper. So it's more like a theoretical uh, essay, an opinionated essay than a, a, a literature review in, in, that, in this last phase. Okay. So, uh, so some journals uh, uh, demand that you to submit a letter of pre presentation letter to 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 show off uh, what you are uh, talking about. What is the 
uh, why your paper is worthy, and etc. Okay. And uh, the first phase of writing the paper is uh, writing an outline of the paper, just like a skeleton that, of the topics that you are going to to approach. Okay. Next thing. Okay. Sometimes when we are uh, inside the process of writing the paper, we become a little lost because some softwares like uh, MEV, Mendeley, and other things. So uh, sometimes uh, you have to remember to focus on writing the paper in instead of uh, re re making the, re rewriting the, the draft of pre previous uh, versions. So uh, one technique that this author gives is that uh, you put yourself inside the behaviorist method. So uh, you, you can uh, write, he, he, uh, does, he, he does that. Uh, he writes at least uh, 500 words, and then only after he wrote 500 words, he uh, allows himself to have a coffee. So uh, I do a little, uh, a little different because uh, 500 words is uh, one and a half or two pages. I, as I am counting pages, not words, I usually uh, write one page and then I go uh, along uh, to, to do the other things or, or bureaucratic things or the, the other things that I have to, to solve along the day. But the first thing that you do in the day is write your paper and then go to the next things. So uh, if you write uh, one page a day, you, uh, the, the, the finish, uh, after you finish the, the period of 15 days, you have a short, short paper. If you, if you finish a, pe a, a period of 30 days, you finish a long paper. So one page a day, you have the time to write the paper, solve the other things that you have to solve, and you give yourself time to digest the ideas between one, uh, one piece of writing and another piece of writing. Okay. Another technique to, to get your paper done is uh, associate with colleagues because some people are more laid back, some people are more proactive. And uh, when you, you write with, uh, uh, for example, a pro, uh, proactive colleague, this person is going to always ask you, your part is done. Is, is it already over? When you are going to finish? So, because this person... Thanks. Because this person is going to put a lot of pressure, of pressure on you, you are uh, going to write faster, just to, to get rid of that... that uh, I don't know how to say that in English. talking on your head, okay? <laughs> um, and uh, this is important because when you submit to a, an event, there is a deadline. And when you submit to a, a journal, the, the most common situation is that they don't have deadlines. Just when uh, there is a, a thing like, like a dossier, I think it's dossier from French, it's okay. They, uh, all, uh, they open a, a, a call to, to papers uh, that are only from one thing, and these of, of papers, are, uh, uh, this, this call have, uh, has a, a deadline. 
but the most common situation, if you don't discipline yourself to to write paper, uh, a paper, the paper won't 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 be finished. Okay. Um, sometimes we we tend to to spell uh, uh, words or construct the phrases and the text in the way that we talk our own uh, mother language. But uh, when you, you go uh, writing in another language, the things change and sometimes we forget that. The, uh, I don't know if the, uh, it's this author or another one. He gives a, a, an advice of paying for the review. There are many uh, 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 journals that uh, offer the service of correcting mistakes of language because they know that the, the, most, most of the authors that are submitting to that uh, paper to that journal are foreign. They are not uh, native. So uh, they, they charge you uh, like three hundred uh, dollars and they review your paper before submitting to the desk review to see if the English is, is okay. Okay. Um, in this section what do edit editors look for? They the author says uh, give some advice of how how uh, you choose your team uh, on a basis of what the uh, editors are looking, uh, 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 are searching. So, uh, the first thing that you have to, to do is uh, do a, a thorough uh, literature review because if you don't have a knowledge of the market, you don't have uh, a feeling of which things are more uh, in the high phase and which things are, are in the low phase. Just, uh, just like, for example, uh, when I was writing the thesis, my thing were more published in the uh, 1990s uh, decade. So uh, when I, I started uh, publishing uh, papers about that thing, uh, st uh, cultural standards, I started publishing here in, uh, in Brazil because in Europe this seems a, a little, was a little outdated. Uh, another things were more uh, fashionable than my thing. But here in Brazil, uh, uh, this uh, theme were, were like uh, exploratory research. And then when we do exploratory research, if the, the thing is uh, in line with uh, other things that are, are appearing in the newspapers and in the, the TV, the, that thing can be, become fashionable in that context. Okay. Uh, when you work with colleagues, it's us uh, usual to to agree which one is going to be the, the, the first author and which one is going to be the last. And uh, you are going to choose the authorship order uh, on the basis of which of you uh, worked more. So when uh, a, a person does a literature review, when a person uh, interprets a, a huge amount of data, usually this person is going to be the, the first author. When a person just uh, uh, writes the introduction or the, the final considerations, considerations of the, the paper, usually this 
this person is the the supervisor and the last author. Okay. So, just uh, to give us a relief, the author uh, uh, presents that the most common situation is that you always have to review a, a little part of the paper. Uh, the, the papers that are unconditionally accepted uh, are very rare and you you usually don't achieve the, this situation. Usually you have to review some part of the theory or some part of the data uh, in order to get published. Uh, an advice that this author gives is that you send the paper uh, a letter showing all the, the corrections that you made in, uh, appointed by, by the, the reviewers and when you don't do a correction, you have to explain in that letter why did, uh, did you, you did not do that correction. What uh, were the reasons from theory or from, from practice that made you uh, get, get to that decision? Okay. And in the, in the case that your uh, paper is really rejected in one journal, you can always submit to another journal after improving a lot of that, that paper uh, with the, using the appointments that the rev reviewers made in the last paper corrections. Okay. The third paper. It's short too. This one I already said. Okay. This another uh, author says that I, if you are going to write papers, you have to do that on a daily basis and try to do that a uh, uh, routine, just like uh, brushing your teeth, taking a shower, and etc. And uh, sometimes you can play with your colleagues uh, some ga games like uh, from draft to full paper in four weeks. Uh, which one of you and your colleagues achieved the, this status first? I don't know if we can do that in four weeks, but in a semester it, it can be. <laughs> because uh, you, if you are going to do a literature review in a field uh, work, you, you are not going to do that in four weeks. I, I don't think so. Um, okay. Uh, another good advice is that you write the abstract section in, uh, in the last step of, of your work. Uh, and the introduction to introduction and uh, final considerations you, you write uh, last in, in your work. I usually write first the literature review, next the methodology, and then I go to the field work, if uh, I have a field work, uh, write the results section, the discussion section. Just then I go to the introduction. After the introduction, I go to the final considerations. And after I do everything, I uh, put that in a, a 250 count, uh, word count in the abstract. 
Sometimes your abstract has to be structured in little sections and uh, little paragraphs, and sometimes the abstract, abstract section has to be uh, a one huge paragraph of uh, 250 words. Okay. Sometimes I see that uh, people are a little uh, confused about the difference between the result section and the discussion section. You already know that, the, the difference, or, or there's the result section and the discussion section of the paper. But, uh, there is uh, some, some paper with the in the, in the, yes, but uh, the re results are the presentation of your data without uh, some uh, interpretation that interpretation that you get from the literature. Uh, if you present data and only interpret this in your view, not the view from uh, the authors, it's it is just results. When you discuss that results uh, uh, with uh, a literature basis, that is discussion, okay? You have to make this distinction. Sometimes, I re I've, I've read a lot of, uh, of papers when I was uh, reviewing papers to journals or, or final works and etc., final reports, in that uh, people only do results, they don't do discussion. And discussion is a very important part of, of your work because if you don't uh, put, put the results and the literature of the area to, to in, into a dialogue, the knowledge of that area is not going to grow. You have to make this di dialogue occur. Um, okay. This also to, to says that unconditional acceptance is very rare, so you don't have to expect to, that to happen. It usually happens only with uh, 80, 80 years old uh, professors that are a lot used to publishing papers. We are not there yet, okay? There is a professor, uh, Geert Hofstede, do you know this, this professor from Netherlands? The, uh, he is uh, from, he studies cultures and the dimensions. If one culture is more uh, with flat high, high hierarchies and another culture is more, uh, more vertical hierarchies and um, if one, one culture is more, um, ha has a more, uh, more equal distribution of power, or if a, a, a culture, a country, has a, a, a more con uh, concentrated uh, amount of power in, in the hands of, a le of few people, and uh, this, this, all these questions. He started studying four dimensions and then five, and I think nowadays he's, he's studying seven or eight dimensions. He started uh, with dimensions of culture that are mainly Western, and in the final, in the last part of, ca of his career, he started uh, studying dimensions that are more common in um, Middle West and Asia, Asian cu cultures. So uh, this professor started uh, writing papers that that ha have that had a high impact factor in the 70s, 1970s, and today we are in the 2000s. So he 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 is publi publishing uh, papers today, but I think that this guy is 80 and and many, many more years old, okay? Uh, Geert Hofstede.
Gerd. His concept is culture by mentions. So when you achieve the status of this guy, always uh, uh, when you, you put your, your, your papers into a journal, uh, they are pre-approved. You don't have to go through blind review or anything because you are only writing invited papers. So uh, what you talk is, is heard and uh, you don't have to cite many references, it's another kind of work. We, uh, when we are starting like us, uh, us here, we have to cite many references and we have to struggle to, to through the process of writing papers and it's normal and it's okay, it's that way that it should be because uh, people don't have to publish things that uh, have low quality, that's okay. Uh, okay. This paper is from uh, doctors, doctors and uh, dentists from uh, Serbia, Serbia, I don't know how to say that, and uh, they get, uh, get to show two points, how uh, we overcome the difficulties of writing in English when we are not native people or native researchers, and uh, they have some some tips on how to get your, your text more readable. So again, uh, they say that we, we have to keep the, the language, the text, as, as simple as possible. I don't know if it's a, a medicine area uh, trait or if, if it's because of, of their uh, culture or, uh, inside Serbia, but uh, they uh, advise, advise us to keep our, our language as simple as possible um, and try to, to avoid very long sentences, avoid very uh, verbose words like uh, that long words that uh, can be substituted uh, by short words that convey the same meaning. Okay. Introduction. Okay. Uh, they stress the importance of always uh, talking in a third person manner, not uh, talking in a first person because in medicine it's a common trait. Only in, in areas like uh, phenomenology, education, psychology, and another, uh, other human sciences or social sciences texts or papers that you can speak in first person. Uh, in more hard sciences papers, you have always to uh, say things in the third person. Okay. Um, another advice is that you try to avoid uh, transform verbs into subs into into nouns uh, by adding the i o n suffix because it uh, makes the the phrases and the text more. Um, more verbals, more prolix, and, and the, this is unnecessary, okay? And uh, when you translate from your uh, idiom, your language, to another language, you have always to remember that 
when we translate to English, usually there are more uh, simple, more sh uh, and shorter versions of that, that phrase that you always can use. So when you translate, you have to try to remember that form of phrase that uh, people are used in English and try to use that shorter and simpler form. So that's okay. Sérvia e Montenegro. The, the good thing about uh, reading papers is that you get to know cultures very different from your culture. So uh, I already read uh, papers from Israel, from Turkey, from, uh, from Slavish countries, from Denmark, and many other countries. You, you see a common trait of the, the scholarly uh, medium, but uh, in, in, inside ca uh, inside each uh, each country, you see some uh, cultural traits that are uh, inside that papers too. So th this is, I think, this is more funny than 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 traveling to that place. I I I, I get more from reading that <laughs> traveling, but. Each walk with its own manner, okay? <laughs> um, verbal communication. Uh, this, I think this uh, paper and just one another inside this class they uh, have an advice of how long should be a title. So this paper uh, says that you have to put your title inside 10 words, not more. And another uh, author says that you have to put your uh, title inside 12 words. So between 10 and 12 words, you are safe. If you put a very long title, just like a Sarah Michael, Sarah Michael's writing, you are not going to get this. Okay. Um, the abstract here, uh, the author says that it has to be between 100 and 200 words. The most authors and uh, journals um, say that it, it has to be 250 uh, words long. Each journal has its its own norms, but the most common are 250 words. This section of abstract is single spaced, and in in uh, foreign journals, the the lines uh, have have to be double spaced. Here in Brazil, the the lines have to be one and a half uh, line spaced. Just, I think, uh, some journals that are Brazilian, but are, um, are inside some international uh, uh, databases, scholarly bases, uh, they uh, usually have this double space norm too. Just the, the journals that, that are A1 or A2, they, they have this uh, double space norm. Okay. People from hard sciences have this section of material and methods. Usually we don't have in human or social sciences. Okay. Some areas have uh, more resistance to uh, internet citations. Some areas are more open to that. So if you are going to write to communication sciences and, and uh, areas that are more uh, innovative, there are no problem in, in using internet citations. In some areas, there are more, more risks. So uh, know your area before using internet citations. And uh, you always have to be careful on how to 
cite internet citations and how to cite uh, leg legislation and other things. Because uh, we usually have, uh, we, we usually are very careful on how to cite books and chapters and papers, but when we cite legislation, when we cite sites, when we cite uh, other media like audio, uh, interviews and other kinds of, of uh, references, we usually uh, are a, li a little reckless. So uh, in this part of the paper, that we cite the more uncommon reference that the reviewers are going to to put more pressure. Okay. So that's okay. So uh, this one uh, is about how to achieve uh, internationality in your paper. So the first uh, advice is that is just because you are publishing paper, a paper with uh, people with, uh, 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 that are from many countries, it doesn't make your paper international. There are more requisites to publish a, an international paper. So the first thing is to make a literature review that it's internationally focused. Um, and it, it, it gives a, a tip on how to publish locally, too. So if you are going to publish a, a paper in Brazil, you have to cover the literature from here and from outside. If your uh, literature is uh, is has few papers only in Brazil, your your research is going to to become more interesting. But if you don't cover the the papers that are are few but are already published here in Brazil, you are not going to be published here just outside. You have to show the, the importance of, of your international literature review by uh, showing the few art, uh, articles or papers that are written here in Brazil about that scene. Hmm? Well, how? Uh, like, oh, you want to live with us? You will have to talk about the your project, but you have to talk about us. Yes, you have to, to pay a fee of, of citing us before citing people from foreign papers. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Sometimes, uh, if your paper uh, it, uh, gets a really high uh, impact factor, sometimes uh, there are people that get envious of you, and they start uh, saying that your paper is not good enough. So one way of improving your impact, impact fa factor and making these people even more in envious of you is uh, responding to that critic. So uh, when some, someone writes a paper criticizing your own paper, you write a paper in response and uh, get even more impact factor. You, you get in this, uh, in this scholarly area just like a, a, that sequel, just like uh, it happens in the movies, Die Hard 1, 2, 3, 4, and etc. Uh, when uh, your concept is very used, is very uh, widespread, uh, people start criticizing and you reply one, two, three, four, ten times and uh, your impact factor gets even bigger and people get even more in view of you. That's okay. <laughs> Okay. 
white people say here in Brazil, beijo no ombro. <laughs> That's okay. Ok. Uh, another thing. Uh -huh. uh, this uh, paper uh, views researchers as uh, missionaries of missionaries of science. So we. We go to, uh, for example, we go to a field work that is inside a country that uh, few people visit, or we study a thing that uh, few people study. So uh, we act as, as Jesuitics, as missionaries of that thing or that uh, region, country, etc. And then we put that knowledge of that region or that thing to to be spread around the world and then uh, that way doing the, this sacrifice of uh, open uh, uh, opening a new, new field that you uh, can can raise your impact factor and your your fame inside the, the, the science okay Here, uh, the author gives a, a broad definition of what is a paradigm, the, what is a paradigm in, uh, in itself, and when uh, it happens a paradigm shift. So, it also says that a paradigm is an encompassing conceptual model that provides a broad frame, framework for a discipline. So, it's like a a landscape of that discipline, and you have to pay attention to that landscape to to see uh, which which face your paper has to have. So uh, this advice is more for the desk reviewers than for us is that uh, we have to keep a balance between maintaining paradigms and uh, accepting the emergence of new paradigms. So if we only maintain paradigms, we, we are left with that situation of uh, thinking, like in the old days that Earth was the center of the universe. And if we only uh, uh, go to the other extreme of uh, only paying attention to innovations, we lose the focus of the discipline because we lose the root of that discipline. So that's okay. And uh, another advice is that we don't uh, use a concept as a dogma, is that uh, you, you use a concept just as a as a mean of uh, knowing, of learning even more of a subject, of a thing, and uh, the concept is not a, a it, it, it's like it's written in stone. The concept is a, a thing that may, may be changed, if, and if you are uh, good enough, you can change that concept to uh, improve the learning of that area for other people. Okay, we are almost over with the part of writing papers, then we are going to the part of building theory. Um, this paper is short, but it has, has a very uh, valuable advice because um, sometimes when we are reviewing work from others for journals, we see literature reviews that are, that uh, um, I, I don't know how to say it in a very formal way than I, I'm going to say in the, the real life way. Uh, 
So uh, these papers, uh, they don't have a heart, I think. They don't know how, what they are doing there when they were submitting the, the paper to, to, to the journal. So there is a literature review that it, it's well done, but uh, there's no hypothesis or premises or opinion, uh, uh, there, there's no thesis. The people only do, does the homework of writing a literature review. You don't know uh, why and, and how and uh, the reason for that to happen. So uh, this author gives the advice that if you don't know how, uh, what is the purpose of, of your research, and if you don't uh, convey, convey the meaning of that purpose in your paper, uh, the paper is not done. You have to, to know why that, that paper is important. Paper or report or anything, thesis, dissertation, and so on. So um, there is a metaphor, a, a parable that the the author gives here. That it's uh, it's like that uh, that that story that they counted when uh, Bettinho from uh, Ebert Souza. What is the name of the program that he created? I don't know if it's. Uh, uh, that's the same form, I don't know. But uh, they usually, uh, Gilberto Gil told the, this, this story uh, talking about this program. Uh, in, in heaven, there, there were uh, people uh, sit around a table, and then uh, in, in hell, there, there were sit, uh, people sit around a table. But in hell, uh, people had the, the this is elbow? Yeah. Okay. The elbows uh, turned inside so they only could put uh, food in the, in the mouth of the other, of other people, not in their own mouth. In, in hell, people starved because of that. In, in heaven, people uh, uh, feed, fed each other so everyone could eat. This story that the author uh, tells here is uh, a little uh, similar to that. So there are many people in the heaven and the hell of scientists, and uh, people are sit around the table, chained to that table, and people are, are studying all day without non-stop. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, the person that were, were, was visiting these two places uh, asked for what was the difference inside uh, between heaven and hell for scientists. In hell, people get, didn't get published. And in heaven, they studied all day, but they get published. You, you saw this paper? That, that was, I think this was a good metaphor for our work. You don't get money, but you get published. That's okay. <laughs> That's enough. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, sometimes I, I, I think like, like Sartre, they, uh, that uh, hell is, is uh, getting along, along with other people. Uh, the, sometimes uh, the more I, I, I get along with people, the more I like the papers. <laughs> Yes, can be. Yes, it's a challenge. Okay, another author that is saying that uh, we have to avoid the convoluting writing style, uh, very verbose nouns and very long sentences. Okay. This study is uh, about uh, why uh, reviewers accept or reject papers, and uh, it's a study based on interviews. 
and the author says uh, that uh, most of the information is about why people reject papers, not why people accept, accept papers. Okay. The first reason people reject papers, and I uh, already did that too, is that people uh, don't give a theoretical foundation on which to build the rest of the paper. Sometimes people uh, give a really advanced mo stat statistical model or people uh, come with a very interesting uh, set of uh, interviews and, uh, and data from interviews. But they fail to discuss the meaning of, of the tables, tables or the models or in the interviews because they don't have the theoretical foundation to do that. So uh, uh, when I, I pick a paper that has this defect, I usually say your data is very interesting, but you have to uh, rewind and do the paper entirely again because uh, the, the outlook of the paper after you do the literature review is going to be another one very different from the, the one that the people is presenting that time. Another, another criteria is a criteria that is very using doctoral uh, research. Your research mo must be innovative. If your research is just a re replication of another research, they are not going to publish in an international journal. Okay. Another uh, foolish way to get your paper rejected is to not meet the submission format of the journal. It, this happens a lot in Anampad. Do you know this event here in Brazil, Anampad? In Ampad, it's a, a Brazilian event, but the submission norms are APA. So everyone submits papers in ABNT and uh, they get rejected just because of that. Good papers are rejected because people don't get a, a pay attention to the APA norms. There are very little uh, uh, difference, just like the year, uh, uh, just. Uh, after the, the author in the references, the, the way of citing uh, authors inside the text is, uh, does not use all, all the all capitals and, and so on. So there are very, very few differences that you can uh, solve inside a two hour lapse, lapse of time, but if you don't solve that, you don't get published on an unpad, for instance. Okay. Sometimes uh, papers are rejected because you uh, do a very long section of a literature review or a data presentation and etc. And you don't uh, divide your paper in, um, in sections. You don't organize well your paper. This is a major re reason for rejection too. Uh, lack of organizing or lack of, or of dividing your paper. Sometimes uh, you use literature that uh, was reviewed inside your thesis or your master dissertation, and you, you forget to make again a literature review when you go, go publish in your paper. And sometimes the last two years or last three years, years were very prolific in that area and you miss some important papers. So uh, when you are uh, uh, writing your paper, you have to remake that, uh, 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 re redo that uh, literature review uh, phase 
because uh, many important papers have, uh, could have been missed. Okay. That's uh, already said. So the writing papers part is over. And I, I am bringing today this building theory part. To find these papers, is, uh, you only have to uh, search building theory in periodicus capis. And uh, if you want to focus a little more, you can uh, ask to only make this research on the titles of the papers. So I found many papers about how to write good theory in many areas. I saw that many people from operations management and uh, from science information is very concerned about uh, how to write a good theory. So the, the more you go to the hard, hard sciences, and the more uh, you get uh, norms or directives of how to build a good theory. The more you go to the human and social sciences, the directive, directives are, are more flexible. So I, I am trying to, to see the, the directives of uh, hard sciences uh, as an ideal, as a platonic ideal of what I, I, I should, should achieve in, in, terms of, in terms of clarity of a theory that I'm trying to construct. Okay. So this paper is uh, is good at, at pointing uh, what is uh, convergent validity and uh, the other types of validity and everything. So this is a good paper to see this platonic ideal of how to build a good theory. And uh, again, I, I would like to highlight the the usefulness of writing a theoretical paper because in, in some contexts you don't have too many data from field uh, uh, because you don't get too, too many interviews or too many uh, questionnaires and everything. So uh, when you write a theoretical paper, you can uh, sometimes skip these, these problems from the field and try to concentrate on what people wrote before. Sometimes you have uh, some concepts that are related, so you can uh, construct a model that uh, puts a relationship be uh, between many concepts that, are, that there are in the sciences and so on. Okay, this author too says that uh, when we read stati stat statistical uh, books, sometimes they, uh, they teach you how to use the method, but they don't teach you very well for, for what uh, the method was designed. So you have to pay attention if the method is, go is uh, going to, to give good data or good interpretation to your phenomenon. Sorry. Telemarketing. Okay. So, uh, if you want to to give a, a to have a, a a more more formal overview of 
uh, how to build good theories. There are uh, many philosophy of science uh, manuals, but uh, I think that when we read papers, we see this philosophy of science more in applied to the sciences themselves. Okay. So, formally, the author says that there are steps to build a good theory. That, let me underline that. First, we define the terms that we are going to use. Just like in a math book, uh, a point is that, uh, uh, a line is that, a segment of line is that, you first uh, define the things that you are going to use. Second, you limit where the theory will apply, the scopus of the theory. So, uh, if your theory is, is about people, in, in the individual case, you can't apply your theory to cultures or countries or regions. So you have to limit the, the scope of, of your theory. Just like what they just did in the, the elements of, of geometry. Uh, third, it will explain what formal conceptual definitions are needed. So, first you, you put the, the things on the, the table then you, you said what, uh, uh, which was the size of the table and where the, this table is located. Then um, you start uh, putting that things on the table in relationship to each other. So, you try to, to Clarify uh, as much as possible that relationships. Okay. The properties of the relationships and last. Okay. You uh, can try to predict situations on, on the basis of that theory you created. So this author defines theory in a very simple way, he, dis he says that theory is defined as an explained set of conceptual relationships. So you state the entities, state the relationship between them, describe these relationships, and try to predict uh, things on, on the basis of your theory. That is good theory. Okay. When we construct involuntarily uh, uh, a bad uh, theory, uh, usually these traits appear. Uh, we usually have unclear measures. We uh, have concepts that uh, are not very well. Uh, they, they don't have very good questions on the surveys to, to measure that concept. Uh, sometimes we define concepts, we put on the table concepts that, that, that have a definitional overlap. So if the, the concepts don't work like a uh, disjunct set, sets, just like math. I don't know if you remember. Here is two concepts that are not very well defined on our theory. So there is a interse intersection area that is uh, harming the theory. So you have to make the concepts as disjunct, as separated as possible, so you, you get to establish relationships 
between the concept, okay? It can be concept A, B, C, for instance. Uh, when we, uh, when I was studying in master degree, uh, the importance of of affectivity to to teach mathematics, sometimes uh, the literature wa was very confused because they uh, confuse uh, emotion, affectivity, and empathy. So these uh, three uh, terms were very confused, very dispersed along the literature. So to separate this concept was very, very complicated. So uh, when you try to build a theory, you, you have to try to pick some concepts that are, are very separated so you don't have this kind of confusion when, when you build. Okay. So the author also gives advice on how to write a good conceptual definition. So you have to be as clear as possible and as simple as possible. So there are te terms that are going to be primitive. Uh, just like a dogma, and some terms that are going to be derived from these primitive terms. So, if you are going to construct a good theory, the number two rule is that your theory is uh, different from another existing theory. If it, if your theory is not uh, differentiated enough from uh, another theory, your theory is not original, so it, it's not going to be published. Uh, there is a, a theory from Parsons and Shields, uh, theory of action. Uh, they, they explain uh, how action is, is is conducted inside society, and there are things that occur in the individual level and things that occur in the collective level. So uh, there are many diagrams, many many explanations. So this theory is very, very important in social science. So it's a good uh, example of how to build good theory. Okay. They uh, they do uh, they on, uh, they don't uh, only describe a phenomena or. Uh, don't just tell uh, people's stories, they uh, try to explain how, how actions are, are done in society, in many levels, and with many diagrams. Okay. The third rule, don't use vague terms because uh, the more vague the terms, the more vague your definition uh, of the concept will be. That's a little obvious. Okay. Number four, rule number four. Okay. Uh, we don't have to be very prolix or robust to define our concepts because the more words you use, the more words you have to hang yourself, okay? So try to be as uh, synthetic, synthetic as possible so your definition gets very clear. 
the fifth rule you have to observe if your uh, definition and your concepts are uh, aligned with the theory with the existing theories that that are already in the field that you are studying so uh, if you build a theory that uh, is uh, not counter but if it it does not uh, pay attention to the things that are already constructed outside your theory you are, are not going to be accepted you are not going and you are not paying attention to the context of your own theory So uh, if you are going to, to try to replace a, a theory that is already existent, you are only going to, to be successful in doing that if you prove that your theory is be better than the, the other one. So if you uh, observe the criteria of refutability and the other ones from Karl you see that uh, you have to to pick the point of the, the, the older existing theory, the, the root points of that old theory, and uh, show that the root points of the old older theory are no longer valid or are updated and etc. Okay, rule six. If you are going to, to pr propose a new concept, you uh, should not uh, let this concept go vague and less precise and broader, broader than the older ones. You have to be better than the older, not uh, worse than the older. The rule number seven. Okay. You uh, he advises not to test new hypotheses. You try to test uh, the old hypothesis with the new theory to prove that your theory is better than the older one. The eighth rule. You should test the validity of your theory and the concepts only if uh, the, you, you achieved to, to comply with the seven-sided uh, seven rules that we, we saw now. Okay. So here is the, the synthesis, the outline of the eight rules that are good to build a good theory. Okay, logical properties. So another uh, way to see properties uh, that it's given by this author is uh, if the concepts that you are putting on the table on the table are all necessary and essential to the concept to the ma macro the major concept. Okay. Uh, Okay. There are uh, some properties that you assume first that you uh, call assumptions or axioms. So uh, some, some, some things you are not going to be able to prove. So these things that you can't prove but uh, that are the basis of your theory are the axioms. The, uh, the, uh, they are phenomena the phenomena that, that uh, are well known in the common sense 
and uh, this phenomenon uh, are, are taken as assumptions. Uh, sometimes when uh, we want to, to beat another theory, we can beat on this, these assumptions uh, showing that these axioms or assumptions are, are taken wrongly in the first place. It's the, the, the easiest way to, to get a, a, a theory down. Okay, uh, in logic, uh, I don't know if you had this, uh, this course, uh, Aristotelical logic. Uh, this, this is a kind, a classic kind of proof. Uh, this is a um, contraposition kind of, of proof. You, uh, you, you are presented with an argument. So when you see this argument, uh, you, you pick that uh, presupposition, that, that initial assumption, and uh, go uh, building another argument to prove that this first assumption uh, is leading to an absurd situation. When you, uh, you face this absurd, you, you say that this first situation, this first assumption is, is wrong. So you uh, can say that this is a proof by contraposition or a proof uh, by uh, reduction to absurd. It, it, this is the, the way to beat this kind of uh, axiom or assumption, to beat a theory. Okay. So in this part, he says uh, there are many types of validity that are important to to be to be taken into account in building the theory. So uh, you have internal internal validity and external validity. So. Another, another uh, uh, way of seeing is uh, face validity, pragmatic, pragmatic validity, and discriminant validity. Uh, the, these three uh, kinds that I, I said now are more important. So the face validity is if uh, your content, your concept is uh, being measured uh, with the right, right rule, the right, uh, right questions, for instance, or the, the right variables or proxies. The pragmatic validity is if you, you can observe this concept in the, the society in general, in the, the natural world in general, and you have to see if the concept that is, is created, created that, and that uh, is being measured is uh, aligned with the idea of that concept in the real world. Um, the convergent validity that I forgot to mention. Okay, uh, if you if you say that, uh, for instance, in psychoanalysis, uh, you have uh, the ego that is equal to superego plus the the id. I don't I don't know how how to say that in English. So uh, if you if you try. Uh, to do this heresy of uh, quantificate that this ego, the super ego, and the id into a um, statistical model, uh, the convergent, convergent validity would be the 
the verification if uh, your concept that is the ego was being uh, uh, aligned with the current notions of superego and Eid, the, and the measures of, of superego and Eid that are uh, existent in the, in the actual literature. But it's just a, a little heresy uh, that I, I am trying to, to show here um, in a way of uh, doing a, a didactical work. It's not, a, a, there is no literature about these, these things that I, I, I'm doing. People from psychoanalysis don't usually like uh, things that are qu quantitative research. Okay, the another kind of validity is discriminant validity, and uh, you have to show that your uh, your concept is uh, significantly different from another concepts uh, that uh, are already measured in the literature. Okay. So here we achieve to some uh, meaningful conclusions. First, we have to avoid casual everyday language when writing papers, because uh, when we write papers and define concepts, this language is not uh, clear enough to build theory. The first conclusion, okay. We have to try to measure things as clearly as possible to, to advance with the theory. The third conclusion. Uh, the more formal, formally you define the concepts, the, the more uh, clarity you have when you define the, the methods. The fourth. Mm. Okay, sometimes uh, we try to make a model that it's m the most comprehensible, comprehensible that it's possible. But um, when you try to make a very big and uh, exhaustive model, sometimes you uh, lose sight of the little relationships, the, the, the main relationship, relationships between the main uh, concepts and variables. So you have to keep a balance of uh, exhaustivity, the compre comprehensiveness of your model, and the clarity of your model. The more synthetic, the more clear, uh, clear your model is. But sometimes this small model is not relevant enough, enough to give a good uh, publication, publishing. But uh, if you uh, spread too much, too much your model, you uh, don't have this model uh, clear and and synthetic enough to be put in a, a single paper of 40 pages. So you have to keep this balance. Okay. So for today, that's all folks. Thanks a lot.